Thank you. What I'd like to add to our discussion on the theme of integration and metropolitan revitalization is an emphasis on its transnational character. <clears throat> this has been a process driven by migrants who have been engaged in essential city-building activities, not just here in the United States, but also in cities and towns in Mexico and other countries in Latin America. Moreover, revitalization has only been possible because these migrantes and their families have gradually incorporated their neighborhoods into a hemisphere urban system, one in which both U.S. and Latin American cities and towns have functioned as part of a single Pan-American network of migration and influence. I'm going to structure my talk into three parts. I'm going to first present my findings from the Oak Cliff neighborhood of Dallas. I'm also working on Chicago. We've heard a lot about it, so I thought I'd focus in on this. Um, then I'm going to zoom out to a hemispheric scale to show how changes in the urban fabric of Latino neighborhoods was linked to corresponding transformations in the built environment of those places of origin. Then after that, I'm going to zoom out one more time to suggest that this Pan-American system forms just one part of a larger global transnational urban system um, that's been under construction really for several decades now. Analytically, I want to make three points. First, I want to emphasize that this revitalization cannot be understood as merely a side effect of a global city's narrative in which capital or foreign investment or economic elites gather in a place and then working people follow them. This has been substantially created by migrants and immigrants themselves. Second, we need to decenter the United States and recognize the importance of larger geographies, and in particular, the decision making of people and governments in Latin America over the past 60 or 70 years. Third, on policy, um, I'm going to suggest that we shouldn't just be trying to attract the creative class or yuppies or hipsters or globe trotting techno wizards. Uh, we should be seeking out immigrants from a broad range of social classes. Let's start with Oak Cliff. Oak Cliff is located about three miles southwest of downtown, and it was really not a very densely settled area until 1941 when the United States Navy built a massive uh, munitions and aircraft plant and therefore provided a whole bunch of very well paying blue collar jobs to people who lived just eight miles to the east in Oak Cliff. As a result, between 1940 and 1950, the local population swelled by more than 75%. Around mid-century, you could really see the prosperity along Jefferson Boulevard, Oak Cliff's main shopping district. Inside the shops, you can see an abundance of uh, consumer goods. Many of these shops, I might add, are small, locally owned businesses. If you look at the exterior photographs from the period, you see a streetscape crowded with cars lined with well-maintained storefronts sporting elaborate signage. Again, some national chains and a lot of locally owned businesses. Indeed, it was right in this mid-century period that Oak Cliff's population reached its 20th century peak. In this, it's much less, excuse me, it's much like a lot of urban America, Detroit, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, St. Louis, lots of cities peaked right there in 1950 as well. Now, this is not to say that Oak Cliff was good for everyone. When the journalist Grover Lewis wrote about leaving the neighborhood that he had lived in as a boy, he entitled a piece about it, quote, Farewell to Cracker Eden, unquote. <laughs> His recollection was that, and I quote, the ethos of the place was absolute white supremacy reinforced by old-time religion and male chauvinist prickism, unquote. <laughs> His opinion was pretty well founded because with the advent of the civil rights movement in Oak Cliff, you see a lot of large-scale white mob action threatening uh, new black families are moving in and occasionally dying by their houses when they're thankfully not at home. So, after that, once they realized it was not going to put an end to the movement, there was large-scale white flight to the suburbs. The neighborhood suffered decades of population loss and general deterioration, so that when Grover Lewis went back and visited his uh, old neighborhood in 1992, he authored a sort of fairly classic urban crisis narrative of, uh, of big city pathology. He wrote, the devastation was total. An entire neighborhood sunk in rot. The surviving houses were vine-choked, boarded up, literally atomizing, in a ghastly mockery of the thriving com community I recalled. I groped for terms to encompass the scope of the disaster. Systemic collapse, municipal cancer, de facto apartheid, social time bomb, a thousand points of dark. <laughs> so again, this is part of the pretty standard urban crisis era narrative. As it turned out, though, Lewis was seeing this neighborhood really in the darkness before dawn, because about a decade before, a decade and a half before, you began to see an influx of mostly Mexican with some uh, Salvadoran immigrants um, who managed to 
I mean, even by the time you wrote, they had already begun to increase the population. It declined to 1980 or thereabouts, and then began to gain the population as a whole. And indeed, by the year 2000, it boasted over 113,000 residents. That was 30% more than its previous peak in 1950. Now, I should say that these basic demographic gains are you know, part of our portrait, um, but that's not all of it. And I want to add that this was very, I think, fundamentally based on certain kinds of state action. In particular, la amnistia, the amnesty provisions of the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, along with all kinds of other terrible provisions, but this one really worked for a lot of people. With their status regularized, which is a path that uh, begins in the 80s and sort of ends in 1991 as well, there's sort of a filing deadline, these migrants and immigrants would collectively devote millions of hours of labor and billions of dollars to revitalizing the neighborhood. So if you look, for example, Jefferson Boulevard had almost no Latino-owned businesses in 1970. Uh, 20 years later, the street was crowded with bodegas, panaderias, taquerias, botanicas, quinceañera, and bridal shops, travel agencies, and money transfer outlets. Right? Latinos become the backbone of local retail. You see a similar effect in residential real estate. Whether you measure this as the median value of owner-occupied property, whether you uh, examine this as median gross rents, um, these were numbers that had all been falling in the 1970s in Oak Cliff, despite the fact that the rest of the city, they've been rising. After 1980, you see those numbers rise in Oak Cliff. The rest of the city, they're actually falling. So they're not just sort of piggybacking onto some existing prosperity or improvement. They're really doing this by themselves, in a sense. Crime also decreased dramatically. Citywide, the homicide rate fell a fraction of its peak. Uh, often use homicide because it creates bodies, and that's a more reliable thing. It's less dependent upon reporting. Um, and I looked at the, the National Neighborhood Crime Studies multi-city data set and ran the numbers there and found that in every, in almost every single tract of Oak Cliff, um, the homicide rate was two standard deviations lower than similarly situated tracts elsewhere in the city. So it's much safer than it should be given its socioeconomic status. And so it's no wonder that by the mid aughts the city's leading newspaper was celebrating Oak Cliff, as, as they put it, the new Latino downtown of Dallas. In the full paper, I talk about some of the same kinds of effects in Chicago's little village, but again, I leave that for the Q&A, or you can read the paper. Um, broadly speaking, right, so these findings certainly do confirm our expectations about the connections between immigration and metropolitan revitalization. They give a sense of population from abroad arriving and turning around in the neighborhood, um, really doing a lot of uh, beneficial stuff for previously decaying urban neighborhoods. However, this account is not really enough to fully understand immigrant-driven urban revitalization. Because as long as our understanding of this phenomenon remains centered on the US, it's going to remain incomplete. We need to zoom out and survey a broader geography. The key point I want to make here is that the migrantes who revitalized Oak Cliff, Little Village, and similar places have done even more than that. They've also rebuilt many small towns and cities in their home countries. U.S. Latino landscapes like these have not just been the result of cultural diffusion from Latin America. They developed in constant interaction with immigrants' hometowns. Using Oak Cliff as an example, um, there migrants arrive, establish themselves, they begin, earn, they begin using some of the income they earn to pay for construction projects back home. They start with their families' dwellings, then they move on to doing community projects. Uh, as the president of the local organization of migrants from Durango told me, um, we started inviting friends, neighbors, and relatives, and organized migrant clubs and neighborhood associations, and started pooling our money to pave the streets of our towns, fix up the schools, provide electricity, and paint our churches. So this really does begin at the grassroots level, but before long, certain governments, particularly in Mexico, really begin to see an opportunity in the activities of these migrantes. They respond by launching new programs that establish new forms of cooperation with migrants on precisely these kinds of construction projects. So it begins in Mexico in 1992. The governor of the state of Zacatecas established the Dos por Uno, or Two for One program, under which Zacatecas State provides double matching funds. So for every dollar that the Mexicanos send to do public infrastructure projects, the state kicks in two more dollars. Dallas and Zacatecas join the program enthusiastically. Um, you have to sort of establish a, essentially a corporation to do that. So they establish the um, Federación de Clubes Zacatecanos del Norte de Texas, right? It's the North Texas Federation of Zacatecan Clubs. Um, this is one of the publications that they put out. 
Um, and with state and municipal support, they begin to multiply their initiatives. They build a medical clinic, a church, a rodeo ring, and every year they celebrate these projects in publications like these. You read through it, they're features about each individual one. After about a decade of this, the Mexican government federally adopted Dos Bordo and rechristened it Tres Bordo, so federal, state, and municipal funds, three for one matching. This is an additional source of funding, and the Zacatecans really redoubled their efforts. So if you look through their photo archive, you can see all kinds of pictures like this one, right? They're doing things like opening classrooms in the tiny town of Fuerte, or this is a new water well that they built in the municipio of Tepechitlan, right? Now, as we zoom out a little, this is not just the Zacatecans, right? So Dallas-based migrants from many other Mexican states also begin to undertake projects through the Tres <coughs> This is a spreadsheet of them. Uh, I'll zoom in so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but there's one of these for every single year. So just to read you a few of them, um, just the migrants just in Dallas. In a few years, built a tremendous variety of projects. Housing, roads, drainage systems, electrical grids, street paving, potable water pipes, lecture halls, community centers, street lights, schoolyards, shelters, chapels, athletic fields, public resorts, a town cemetery, and a water park. We look at Chicago migrants, who are even more numerous and active, we see even more projects. Um, this is the sort of national, every single one of those tableau of inning has a full sort of hundreds of entries of, of projects. So in just 2004, Chicago hometown associations were involved in things like paving roads in the Mexican state of Hidalgo, building community centers in Guanajuato and Oaxaca, building potable water plants in a bullring in Guerrero State, improving an electrical grid and building a child welfare office in San Luis Potosí, and just in the state of Michoacán, constructing or improving roads, children's parks, agricultural facilities, egg incubators, playing fields that are associated to observation stands and bathrooms, and a public library. So all told, in its first 10 years of operation, the Tres Por Uno program grew from 20 clubs, like the Federación, to 795 clubs. And they invest a total of 12 billion pesos, which at the prevailing exchange rate was about $1 billion in towns and cities in Mexico. And that's just the Mexicanos. Other governments across Latin America copy Mexico's Tres Por Uno program, including El Salvador, Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. So, really, in the broadest sense, these transnational migrants, this is the clubhouse of the Federación um, of Zacatecan Clubs, in the broadest sense, these transnational migrants have initiated a sustained exchange of people, money, and construction that clearly, concretely, and massively links communities and reshapes built environments throughout the hemisphere. They were in the most material sense creating what I'm calling a hemispheric urban system. And I think this transnational aspect is really essential to understanding the full phenomenon. So for example, if you think about the revitalization of Oak Cliff and other neighborhoods, that's substantially um, due to adaptations of certain kinds of Latin American spatial practices. Stuff like spending time in La Yarda, right? a Spanglish term meaning your front yard. So what I mean, that was in particular do is put a chain link fence around the front yard so you can let the kids run around, they won't get hit by a car because they can't get out. And that was sort of going to be the nature of my question. Is that this is an extremely common sort of thing. So whether we can link the, you know, there in front at a time when there's a lot of literature saying Anglos have abandoned the front yard and retreated into the entertainment room in the backyard. The presence of these folks as eyes on the street, going back to Jane Jacobs, I think could be a causal link in that drop in crime in neighborhoods. Um, I might add that, so in addition to La Garda, uh, a willingness to walk places instead of driving, got lots of juicy quotations, but I did solicit them when I say, you know, Anglos seem to drive through there, we're actually willing to walk. That in turn feeds into locally serving local businesses that sort of, uh, prevent the flight of big box retailers that has hit so much of Anglo America, or it, it did for a while. I might add that a lot of the new businesses that are created are precisely for the purpose of moving people and information and money back and forth across the border. So just the fact that transnationalism generates additional business activity in this neighborhood and I'm guessing others. The other thing about the transnational angle is that it reminds us of the importance of governments. Rural urban migration within Mexico, for example, since it's by far the largest group of people, it really starts in large part due to Mexican government policy of urban investment starting in the 1930s, right? Import substitution, industrialization, um, and really a starving of the countryside drives a lot of people off the land. That's a policy decision. There are policies like it in the Dominican Republic and many other countries, but the Rico, same deal. Um, I might add that also you see the dramatic increase in Latin American migration, in particular right after their governments abandon these policies. So when the Chicago boys sort of get to them and say, no, it's knock this off, it'd be an export 
export-oriented economy. Um, that reduces the carrying capacity of Latin American cities and fosters migration here. So there's sort of a longer process of urban, excuse me, rules of urban migration, but it starts there, ends up here because of state policy. And then, as I've just suggested, as uh, Mexican and other Latin American governments begin to cooperate with these migrantes, there's another layer of um, their government policy really dictating outcomes here. So in a very real sense, Urban revitalization here depends on government decision making there. So if we're bringing the state back in, we're bringing the Latin American state back in, in particular. All right, now having based this entire paper on the idea of Pan American urban system, I actually want to expand the frame just one more time. Because I think that another round of decentering is in order. One that takes us from a hemispheric to a global perspective. After all, Mexican and other Latin American migrants are not really limited to this half of the planet. Uh, if we take just the example of Mexicanos again, their country is, of course, one of the world's largest exporters of people. Um, and so, empirically, it makes sense to adapt really the, the approach of historian Donna Gavaccia, who famously recast the study of Italian immigration to the United States as a story of Italian migration out of Italy, which by her account involved 27 million people over those many decades. So if you want to ground these ideas empirically, you could start with the Mexican government's list of its citizens' associations worldwide. Some of these are the same folks who are doing the actual remittance and matching, others are not, but this is the very end of the list. So as of the 2012 list, um, there are 2,416 Mexican uh, associations abroad. Now, it's pretty heavily centered in the U.S. About 2,200 of the 2,400 plus are, are registered just in the U.S. Um, but in many cases, they're also not. So what you hear, what you have here is sort of in spreadsheet form. It's nonetheless a geographic representation of today's Mexico de Afuera, right, or Mexico abroad. Um, so if you, uh, just to give you a sense of what countries they're in, about 7 to 8% of the total associations are in other countries. And so in Spanish alphabetical order, these include Germany, Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Bolivia, Canada, Chile, China, South Korea, Spain, France, Guatemala, Honduras, Italy, Japan, Norway, New Zealand, the Netherlands, the UK, Sweden, and Switzerland. Now, the research is still to be done on the way that Mexicans might be influencing urban landscapes in other countries, but given what we know about Latino landscapes here, it would be fairly unexpected if they weren't at least doing something to the urbanism in these places. And with regard to the development of infra infrastructure in Mexico, it suggests that it's not just being paid for in dollars, but also in euros, pounds, yen, kroner, and other currencies. And if we look yet even more broadly, this is likely to be just the Mexican example of what other countries are doing as well, right? Integrating themselves into transnational networks of migration and remittance. So considering this as a conceptual totality, uh, we really do see that migrants have been building their own transnational urban system from below in ways that have shaped metropolitan areas for decades and will probably continue to do so in the future. All right, to sum up, I just want to emphasize a few key points as to what the implications of all this are. To begin with, I want to insist once again on the, uh, the idea of doing this from the bottom up, starting with the migrantes themselves. I try to suggest that they were among the first to act, and others, whether governments or, or other private actors, uh, followed them. Um, this is important because one of the basic ways of understanding transnationalism today is the global cities discourse, which is really smart. Saskia Sassen and others who have done that work, it's true, it's smart, it's fabulous, you can't understand the world without it, right? However, there are certain assumptions about the, you know, the chronology of it, and it starts with large-scale capitalist restructuring. Cities take on new roles in the new global economy. White-collar professionals all move to the cities to service the big firms that coordinate this, and then third-world migrants follow them to babysit their kids, clean their houses, and empty their trash baskets. Right? That is unmistakably the teleology. She's added more stuff on immigrants, you know, in the second, third, and fourth edition, and it's great stuff. The basic, you know. Dynamics of it are the same. Right? It's, it's big, important financial people, and then we got this last. But I'm going to suggest that that's not the only way it happens. My initial inspiration for doing this was to say, you know, this is history from the bottom up, social history, standing up for the little guy. Then I realized, well, it's not just that. Chronologically, she's saying, well, this restructuring happens sort of around 1980, whereas the origins of a lot of these migrations are well before that. So you can't simply assign it as a matter of chronology. Um, a lot of this simply is not following the rules that she sets forth and a lot of people follow. Um, so really this is sort of another way that I think we should decenter our thinking by not just focusing on the metropole, but imagining you know, the actual agency 
uh, in what would have been called the periphery. And policy-wise, this is not rocket science, policy-wise. Right? Uh, really, if you look at even the friendly pro-immigrant discourse in urban policy, it's very often predicated on attracting high-scale, high-wage immigrants. They really do focus on that. Um, and this is, I think, the, the popular slash policy Janus phase of the global cities um, uh, discourse. Richard Florida doesn't actually cite Saskia Sassen in his book, but all of the assumptions that underlie both of what they're doing you know, are all the same. So I want to insist that you know, we shouldn't just try to build on the creative class or other elite immigrants, um, but look more broadly. And here there's, you know, there's a Fiscal Policy Institute study from a few years back, 2010, that says that the fastest growth is not in communities with just high wage immigrants, but rather in communities with immigrants from a broad range of class backgrounds and wage levels. And I think that you know, my research is a historical example of how this could work in a heavily working class neighborhood. So you know, in sum, uh, these migrants have managed under very difficult conditions to revitalize cities, suburbs, and rural areas across America and the Americas. And if we just do some fairly obvious thing, right? passive citizenship, reinvestment in education and infrastructure, I'm pretty sure they can do the same thing elsewhere. Thanks very much.